Hey everybody, this video is just going to go over a couple of practice problems from the textbook from section 1.5 just to give you a little bit more explanation and a little bit more help in case you're having troubles or just to review some of the problems. So I'm going to pick one here. This is question number one that I just want to graph the inverse of this function. So the way we would do this is we would just pick out some points and if you remember to do the inverse graph, we're basically going to take all the x y's that we find on the graph and we're going to flip them to y x because that's what the inverse does it flips its x's and y's so our job right now is let's just find some x y points on this graph that it solidly goes through for example i know it goes through this point here at zero one um looks like it goes really well through this point here it's like four negative one and then i'll pick one more over here at nine negative two. Okay, so let's go point by point here, friends, and we're going to literally flip our x, y values. Okay, on the left side, we had 0, 1 is going to flip to 1, 0. The next point was 4, negative 1 is going to go to negative 1, 4. And finally, last point was 9, negative 2. Oh, we're going to be a little bit off the graph. But it'll be negative 2, 9, which is just about estimating up here or so. Okay, those are going to be the points of my inverse. Now, which way does it go? Do I start on the top and swoop down right? Or is it start on the bottom and swoop up left? Well, if you remember, this point here is the end point of the original graph. And the end point will always, always flip on the inverse to the other end point. So if that blue point that I circled was the end point of the original, then this blue circle right here is going to be the endpoint of our inverse. Okay, well, here we go. So let me start there. I'm going to swoop up. You see the original graph curves, so this one is also going to curve up like that. And there you go, friends. There is inverse of f as a graph. So we picked the points on the original, we flipped the x's and y's, and we graphed our answer. Remember we said that the inverse and the original function should have this really cool symmetry across this diagonal line. That's a great way to double check. After you graph it, just either imagine this, horizontal, this uh, diagonal line or draw it yourself. And doesn't it look like they're both symmetric across that line? Okay, so there's one type of problem, the graphical type. Let's do more of the algebraic type. If I give you two functions, I give you f of x, and I give you its inverse, can you prove or show that they're inverses of each other? Now, do you see this kind of strange stuff over here? For these kind of problems, friends, you can ignore this. We don't really need it. It's just used to help define the functions. And in later problems, we might use it. For this type of problem, though, you don't need to worry about this. So if you see this, don't let it throw you off. Okay, to show and prove their inverses, we have to use the definition. What's tempting is, let's just find the inverse of f and did we get this guy back out? Yay, we did it. But that's actually not the correct way to do that. We actually have to use the definition, which means I need to show that I plug one function into the other. It's going to be the same thing as if I did it the other way around. And when you do that, friends, you remember, by definition, what should you always get out when you plug a function and its inverse into each other? Yes, sir. There you go. So that's our goal. We're going to do one. We're going to do two. And both of them, we hope we get this back out. Okay. So let's try it. Let's do how about, let's do f of f inverse of x. So that means you're taking the inverse function and you're going to plug it back into the original, substituting in for x. So that means my friend up here, here's my inverse is going to go into my original function in for x, which means he's going to go and substitute right there. Can you see it? Here's what's going to happen. We're going to get 2 minus, not x squared, but the square root of 2 minus x squared. See how I plugged the inverse in for x in the original? All right. Now, if you do it right, friends, things are going to cancel beautifully. You see you've got 2s that are probably going to die off. You have squares and square roots. Well, the first thing that has to die is the square ring and square root. Those cancel each other out, and you get 2 minus, watch your parentheses here, friends. How about 2 minus x left on the inside? Okay, well, I can get rid of those parentheses, but I do have to distribute that negative, right? How about 2 minus 2 plus x? 
We see the twos are going away. See ya. Oh, look. Look what we're left with. X. Beautiful. Great job. That's what we wanted, right? And so we got it. But we're not done. First one, check. Second one still needs to do. So let's do the other direction where we have to plug the original back into the inverse. This is f inverse of f of x. Okay, this is the correct way to show that. All right, now I'm going to plug my original function into the inverse. And it's going to go in right where the x is right there, buddy. And let's see what this looks like. This means I have the square root on the outside of 2 minus... All right, I'm plugging the original function, so I should probably use parentheses just to be careful, right? There we go. Do you remember in the other video we talked about when you cancel things, whatever order you did the first time over here, you're going to do the reverse over here. So in the first one, when I did my canceling, see what I canceled first? I canceled the squares and square roots. And then over here on the end, I canceled the twos. So when I go the other direction, can you see that I'm eventually going to cancel the twos first and then the squares and square roots? But before I do it, let me do a little bit of algebra here, just cleaning up, getting rid of that negative sign, okay? So I'm going to take the square root of 2 minus, release the parentheses, 2 plus x squared. Okay, I see that radical and I see the square and I really want to cancel it. But really, really, the first thing that you have to cancel first are the twos. Again, going in a reverse order from the first one. So twos are good by. And you're left with the square root of x squared. Oh, yeah. That was the first thing that we canceled last time. So, of course, this is going to be the last one. The square root and the squaring are get out. And look what we have, friends. And that's what we wanted. Okay? So to show that these two functions are inverse of each other, we had to show that f of f inverse equals f inverse of f, which always gives you x back out. Have we proved it? Yes, sir, we have, and that's the way to do it. All right, the other two are the same kind of problem, and these are the most involved types that we see. If this is f of x, here's what I want you to do. It's pretty involved here. We need to find the inverse. We need to prove that you found the inverse. And then here's the big one. We need to find the domain and the range of both the original and the inverse. We did that at the end of the last video, but it's kind of quick, so I want to expand and really show you how to do that in this video. Okay, so the first two you're fine with. We did that in the last video as well, but let's just walk through it. All right, let's find the inverse. So what we're going to do, if you remember, I need to switch x's and y's. So in order to switch x's and y's, I first need a y. So where is my y? Ah, it's f of x, right? So we're going to change f of x into y. And then we're literally switching the x and y values, variables, and we get x equals to y plus 3. Awesome. And then we don't usually like to solve equations for x equals. We usually like y equals. So let's just move things around, do some algebra, and you'll see that y eventually equals x minus 3 divided by 2. Okay, subtracted 3 and divided by 2. And then last, last step really is to change it back into our really fancy inverse notation. Because we started with the notation for f, let's end with f inverse. And there you go, friends. There's part one. Find the inverse. Yes, we did. Okay? Now, part two. We need to show their inverses, and that's exactly what we did in the last page. You need to show that f of your inverse should be the same as f inverse of the original. And they should all cancel out beautifully and get x. Okay? Let's try it. Let's do this one over here first. So I'm going to plug the inverse that I got in the box back into original. I'm not going to draw arrows this time. I wonder if you guys can see it yourself. Okay, ready? If I plug the inverse back into the original, I should get two parentheses x minus 3 over 2 plus 3. All right, that's plugging the inverse back into the original. All right, well, I'm multiplying on the outside by 2, which is really just 2 over 1. So can you folks see that I can actually cancel these 2s right away because I'm multiplying those fractions and I'm dividing 2 by 2. All right, that gives me, how about, well, I'm just left with x minus 3 overall. And then the plus 3 that was hanging out on the outside. And the 3s are gone. What are we left with? What did we want? x. Great, we got it. 
Just take a little peek, folks. You see how I canceled the twos first and then the threes last. So can you imagine what is the order when I do this second one? Okay, ready? Here comes this one. Let's plug the original back into the inverse. Okay, again, I'm not going to draw arrows or anything. Can you figure out what it's going to be? I think it's going to be 2x plus 3 minus 3 over 2 where I plug the function back into my inverse, and there it goes. Remember, we canceled the twos first and the threes last. So that means we should now cancel the threes first and the twos last. But first, shall we get rid of those parentheses? There's nothing multiplying in the front of them, so I can just release the parentheses. All right, we should cancel the threes first, right? And we will. Get out! And therefore, I should be left with 2x over 2. Remember, the twos were canceled first the last time, so they're here, they're canceled last, and goodbye. And you're left with x. And there you go, folks. I love proving this one. I love proving the inverse of each other because it's just algebra and so satisfying to cross those things out and see it equal x when you're done. Okay, here comes the tough part, part three, where we need to show and find the domain and range of both f and f inverse. Okay, so first of all, let me make a little list here for you. Here's f of x. Here's f inverse of x. Here's my domain and my range for the original. Here's my domain and range for the inverse. Now, before I get started, friends, this is really, really important. Remember how we said the domain of the original is always equal to what in the inverse? The domain of the original is always equal to the range of the inverse. Remember, the x's and the y's flip. And similarly, the domain of the original, uh, sorry, of the inverse is always equal to the range of the original. Oops. The domain of the inverse is always equal to the range of the inverse. So even though we're trying to find four things, do you see that we're only trying to find really, really two? Because once I found one, I found the guy over here. Once I found this one, I found this friend over here. Okay, so the best thing is, is to just find the two domains and then we're pretty much done. Okay, let's talk about domain for a second here, friends. Let's go back to our original up here. And let's talk about domain. Do you see any of the danger zones? Do you see any kind of square root radicals? Nope. Do you see any kind of fractions with x in the denominator? Nope. So there's no problems. There's no danger zones. So when that happens, do you remember what's the domain? If anything is cool, it's all real numbers. So the domain of my original is just all real numbers, which means what else is all real numbers? Travel down here, and the range of my inverse is therefore also all real numbers. Good job. Okay, now to find the other two, I, I don't really know how to find the range of a function algebraically. I'm really good with domains, so why don't we just always, always do the domain? So let's find this friend over here. Let's go to where we found our inverse here in the box. Same two questions, friends. Do you see any square roots? No. Do you see a fraction? Yes. But do you see a fraction with x in the denominator? Is there any way that the denominator can ever equal 0? No. So actually, even though he's a fraction, he's a very safe fraction. We like him. So what's the domain of my inverse? If there's no danger zones, the domain of that one is also all real numbers. And because you found the domain of the inverse, you have also therefore found the range of the original. Okay, so always think of this diagonal pairing up when you solve these kind of problems. And always look for the domains because they'll always give you the range of the other friends. Okay, now let's do one more problem. This one's a little bit more involved, but can we do all three steps again? I want you to find the inverse, I want you to prove their inverses, and I want you to find the domain and range of both the original and the inverse. Okay, do you want to pause the video and try on your own? Great, or if you just want to follow with me, We'll do it together. All right, friends, here we go. Number one, doing a great job so far. Let's find the inverse. So first step, let's change the f into y. And again, I'm looking up over here. I'm getting like, what is that? For now, don't worry about it. It will actually come back and help us in this problem, but I'm not going to cross it out. But for now, you can just ignore it. Okay, so let's just switch x and y's. Okay, when you solve for y this time, you're going to be eventually subtracting 1, dividing by 2, and you need to take a square root. 
and that's what you get. Now, actually, to be absolutely algebraically correct, you really, really should get a plus or minus out because you're taking the square root of a squared variable. But for these kind of problems, I'm not going to stretch your brain that much. I just want you to get this far and be good to go. Last step, just a little bit of house cleaning. If the original was f, then you can rewrite this friend as f inverse. And this first part is done. There you go. There's your inverse. How'd you do? Number two, let's prove that there are inverses. So we need to show f of f inverse equals x and the other way around. Let's do this first one. Okay. So f of f inverse, I'm going to plug my inverse back into the original. That is 2 times x minus 1 over 2 whole thing squared plus 1. Do you see that? That's a little complicated. But I plug the inverse, what was in the box, in for x in the original. Okay, there's a lot of things canceling, folks. Do you see the 2's multiplying and dividing? Do you see the 1's adding and subtracting? And then do you see the squares and square roots? By order of operations, by PEMDAS, what do you have to cancel first? Notice that addition and subtraction is always at the end, and multiplication is right before that. So we are going to do like exponents and parentheses first. So I'm going to kill off the squaring and the square rooting first. And I get 2 times, well, just x minus 1 over 2. Because the square root is now gone. Now, we have addition and subtraction, but we also have multiplication and division. We have to do PEMDAS. So we have to do the multiplication and division first. So the 2's are gone. And we're left with x minus 1 hanging outside is the plus 1. And look at that. Great job. That's what we needed to get, and that's what we got. Okay, take a brief look. What did we cancel first? And then second, and then third. And when we do the reverse right now, friends, it should go exactly in that reverse order. Okay, we're going to do f of, uh, sorry, f inverse of f of x. I'm going to plug the original into the inverse. This is going to be a little messy, but again, you know the order in which we're going to cancel, right? So that's going to help us out. All right, that is the original plugged into the inverse. Can you see that? Okay, what did we cancel last the first time? We're the ones, so we're going to cancel the ones first this time. But again, I don't really like those extra parentheses in there, and since we don't multiply in the front or anything, so I can totally just get rid of those parentheses. Okay, so look at our order. We're going to eventually do the ones first, then we're going to do the twos second, and then we're going to do the squaring, square rooting last. Ready? Can you see it? The ones go first, get out, and I'm left with the square root of 2x squared over 2. Okay, the 2 should be next, right? Get out. I'm left with, this is so satisfying to just see everything undone and undoing itself. And you did it, guys. There you go. You just showed that f and f inverse are really legitimately inverses of each other. Okay, let's take this problem now. We're going to do domain and range for everything. And this is going to get tricky. Now, really, really watch this one for number three. Okay, let's make that list that we did last time, right? We did f of x. What's the domain? And what's the range? Now, I have f inverse over here. What's the domain? And what's the range? Okay, let's talk about domain of the original. Now, the domain of the original, if I go back up to the top and I look at my original, it looks like right now, again, there's no square roots. There's no x's in a denominator. It should be all real numbers. But remember we talked about that sometimes we have to restrict our domain because this function actually doesn't really have an inverse function. If you think about it, this graph here is actually a parabola that's been shifted up one. And you know by the horizontal line test, this guy actually doesn't have an inverse function or an inverse that is a function. So what we did over here on the side is we restricted the domain, which means I'm only going to use part of it. Well, I restricted the domain, meaning, well, this is the domain. Yay! So when you guys see this in a problem, just know, oh, yeah, there, there's the domain. There's my x values that I'm going to use. So, dude, I'm just going to literally cut and paste that down here. That's the domain of my original. How easy is that? Not only that, 
But what else did you just find as a bonus? The domain of the original is the same as the range of the inverse. But I'm not going to write x is greater than or equal to 0 and just write like that. Remember, this is range, right? Range is not x. <laughs> range is y. But the other thing else, everything else in that part is the same. x is greater than or equal to 0, so the range would be y is greater than or equal to 0. You see how they match? Okay. Now, to do the domain of the inverse and the range of the original, which should also be the same, we should do the domain of the inverse. That's easier to find. Okay. Our inverse, our inverse is right there. Okay. Well, you look at that. That is a radical, so we have to deal with that. Back to section 1.1. Are you ready? Here we go. So I'm going to take this, as you remember, friends, from before. This is one of the danger zones where I do have a radical here. So remember what we did? We ripped this expression out, and it can't be negative. So we set it. Do you remember? Do you remember? Do you remember? Like that. Okay, let's solve for x. Let's multiply by 2. And I'm multiplying by a positive 2, so I'm not changing the signs. 2 times 0 is 0. I'm going to add 1, which again is not changing the signs. And there you go. There's the domain of my inverse. So that's the domain of my inverse. Hey, what else did you just find? The range of your original. But is it x? No, it's range, right? So it's y is greater than or equal to 1. So notice that the inequality and the numbers match. You're just switching letters. Okay, let me look at that one more time because that was a pretty complicated problem. We found the domain of the original and it was given to us. That was sweet. And the domain of the original gave me the range of the inverse. I just had to switch letters. And then in order to find the domain of the inverse, I had to go back to section 1.1 where we learned about finding domains because that was the danger zone. Once I found it, then I was able to go over here and find the range of the inverse. All right, friend, that's it for the practice problems. Hopefully this gave you a little bit extra understanding of what's going on in this section. Feel free to watch this again if you need to and go over these algebraic type problems or the graphical problem that we started with. Great job, everybody. See you next time.